Stripped to their original purpose, Voyager's cargo bays reverted to Starfleet specifications. Supplies and equipment from seven years of exploring transferred. Evidence of the Delta dinner gone. No boot steps or crew conversations peppered hallways. Corridors deserted, except for a ship's low hum. Overhead lighting set to energy-saving minimums. Calibrated sensors inside science labs lay dormant, unable to collate, gather, or discover. Sickbay prepared, as though space dock fresh, but with no patience. Stellar cartography, a room as space black inside as outside. Voyager's holodecks, placed in maintenance mode, locked out anyone's imagined scenarios. The briefing room lay vacant, deprived of senior staff, and a captain's ready room, closed and devoid of function. Voyager's galley, however, offered food service. Admiral Patterson granted Chell's non-critical position extra finishing time. On condition, he disconnected the power to Neelix's bespoke cooking system. The self-employed Bolian retained the mess hall to his exact standards. Chell's obliviousness worked in the crew's favor, raising their mood with a final communal meal. The canteen operated like a last-chance saloon, to forsake previous roles and cushion themselves against the Delta Dinner's anti-climax. Minutes after Patterson gained command, a ship-wide announcement by Chakotay pressured the people from the Valjean to convene in Holodeck 1. Nobody mentioned the Valjean since sacrificing the craft, keeping the caretaker's array away from opportunistic Kazon. The seriousness with its reference haunted and caused confusion. As X McKee filed into the holodeck, Chakotay updated them on their discharge orders. Tuvok, serving as the highest-ranking officer on duty, attended. Chakotay's briefing robbed Maquis compatriots of appetites and high spirits. Bureaucratic directives existed to displace them. Colleagues accustomed to working on Voyager had contemplated staying in the service on their return. Starfleet nullified such desires, but the contingent benefited from the wiggle room, granting solace. Chakotay assured everyone there wouldn't be inquests, court trials, or jail sentences. Decision makers told them in simple terms to go home. If they needed proof of Starfleet's twisted sense of sincerity, during the dinner celebrations, security officers arrested remaining Equinox crew members and transferred them aboard the USS Sovereign. A warped fate for Chakotay and company, with Starfleet placing their predicaments above even Captain Janeway's. Thank you for downloading Season 8 of Star Trek Voyager, where the journey continues. This podcast supports chapters for convenient listening. Previous episodes we watched on YouTube and Netflix. Researching the Star Trek canon with thanks from MemoryAlpha.com. Some files sourced with thanks from TrekCore.com. Story ideas were discussed on Reddit in r slash Daystrom Institute. If you'd like to donate, check the show notes. I have a $2 Patreon offering extras. I would also love your support to make the YouTube version a reality. Sleepy Tom Paris tied his wife's nightgown over his pyjamas, and with a blunt action, wiped grime from eyes desperate for more sleep. I know, it's crazy. Harry squeezed his bottom lip against his teeth, which prevented him from sharing further updates. He sank into his chair and dropped his hands into his lap. Balana walked into the lounge dressed in a casual wine-coloured two-piece. She brought Tom his morning drink, 
The 90-minute head start with baby duty allowed her to assess Harry's update. So they made you lieutenant. We lost our captain along with a third of the crew. Ugh, Starfleet! Miral slept through yesterday and allowed the Paris family to cruise through their first day together. Better than both parents hoped. Miral's peaceful manner mirrored yesterday's joy. Harry noticed Tom coming to a realization. He leaned forward as though to hear his response more quickly. Torres stood, glancing at Miral lying on their bed. Her arms squeezed her sides. She didn't need a troublesome daughter today. We've also got a new first officer. Congratulations. Harry collapsed into his seat. Tom, I'm serious. But you are technically second in command now. Thanks. Look, the promotion is one issue, but it's... Uh, it's... Our friends, they're being punished. It isn't fair. Bilana scrunched her nose at the thought and shook her head, while Tom massaged his cheeks as though washing his face. She has to fight the charges. Harry recounted when Admiral Patterson took command, withdrawing Tuvok and himself from the dinner. Tuvok then arranged for the Maquis officers to convene with him and Chakotay. With more crew members disappearing, people noticed the cargo bay becoming more spacious. The captain has been in her quarters since the Admiral's arrival. Tom moved to the bedroom, hid the nightgown, and looked for different clothes. Berlana spied her husband as he spoke. Patterson taught Janeway. He won't be his cheerful self. As a child, Tom met various command-level officers and academy lecturers. Owen Paris and Theoderic hosted regular family get-togethers while positioned at Starfleet HQ. Harry stared at the USS Sovereign outside and raised his voice. The Admiral was already en route when he received new orders to take command. Belana tried pacing but lacked room. Her husband's way of packing was to spread their items across the floor. She guessed Tom treated this exercise like an engineering problem. Chakotay, how was he? Before Chakotay left Tuvok's debriefing, he acted unburdened, and I didn't see him after that. Tom returned, fixing his sleeves. Worse still, they could have all been thrown in jail. They? It's me as well, don't forget. Sorry, I haven't forgotten. Belana didn't notice his outstretched hand and confronted Voyager's newest lieutenant. We need to speak to Chakotay. At the door's beep, the three turned their necks like curious meerkats. Enter. Panels parted. Balana dumped her guarded posture. The human side spoke. We were planning to meet you. Chakotay smirked. I found a conspiracy and saved you a trip. What's up? What's up? You lost your command, our friends are out, and the captain of- Chakotay picked up Miral and smiled. His glee at meeting her muted Balana's complaints. A warrior's posture softened. With a nod, he instructed his engineer to sit. Tom and Harry watched her next move. Singled out as the only one standing, she acquiesced. Confident he ensnared her attention, he answered while stroking the baby's hand. Seems that way. Ship duties were no longer my responsibility after today anyway. I didn't understand what that meant until now. With heated breath and gesturing with her palms, she invited him to share his reasoning. You're fine with this. Starfleet wants me gone. No strings attached? Then yes. Captain Proton gawked, expecting more outrage but understood the calm acceptance of painful news. Balana thought to strangle the grinning man, but Miral lay in between. She skewered with an unflinching barrage of questions. I can't believe I'm hearing this. Did you confer with your animal guide? What about these last seven years? Doesn't it matter? Balana Torres, it matters. But how do you propose we go a second round with Starfleet? She weighed the Maquis crew's conduct against an unfair executive decision. To her, the callous disregard, even without facing charges of treason, wounded. Everybody agreed the Maquis contingent deserved more recognition for their effort with returning a top-of-the-line vessel. Before you ask, I haven't seen Catherine since Patterson boarded. Convinced with his explanation and with no enemy in sight to punch at, Balana relaxed her fists and asked how best to proceed with Janeway's trial. Tom held his wife's shoulders. You're not Starfleet anymore. Our captain is alone on this. Her face fell into her palms. A half-muffled voice emanated from the gaps between her fingers. Does anyone know how she is? Commander Tuvok is with her. Comforted at the news, she lifted her profile and pushed her hair back. Good, that's a relief. Is it? Catherine's arms stretched thousands of kilometers towards Earth. 
The planet floated in a cosmos containing no stars, and she couldn't see her own limbs within the void. Q's voice travelled everywhere. Origin. Unknown. She stopped floating in a black ocean her senses couldn't comprehend, and listened. The omnipotent being argued with the Judge Advocate General. Q fulminated against the assembled admirals. Our client is innocent of all charges, Your Honours. This court has determined the defendant is guilty. Our all charges. No. Q snapped his fingers, and she saw the flash. Two female security officers from the USS Sovereign guarded his captain's quarters. Commander Tuvok stood in between both women, pressing the door panel. No response to the initial beep. He tapped the controls again, and the doors parted, revealing a misty-eyed Catherine leaning against the wall. Morning, Captain. Dressed in a satin nightgown, and without saying a word, she tilted her head, signaling for him to enter. Tuvok sat, his posture stiffer than usual. Disorientated from sleep, his host didn't notice. He detected no coffee scent emanating from her cup on the table between them and waited for her to dress. He spied her lack of desire to rush. She sighed, knowing he hesitated interrupting her. Tuvok discerned the upset shrouded in her tiredness. Catherine eased into her chair, as though her back suffered from an old injury. What can I do for you? It's what I can't do for you. I will return to Vulcan and receive treatment for my neurodegenerative disease. Janeway jolted forward with a gasp. Of course. The foul Torvo. I informed Admiral Patterson. He understands, but finds it inconvenient. Catherine vocalized her first thought. Voyager is without a second officer, then. Fortunately, we still have Mr. Kim. Fuzzy eyes filled with thoughts stared through him, oblivious to his logic-endowed wit. Her chin rested on a half-open palm with coiled fingers. Tuvok inferred his departure worsened the list of concerns she wrestled with. Catherine shook off the self-imposed trance and placed clasped hands in her lap. Well, Voyager isn't going anywhere. Thank you, Captain. I can return inside a week. Tuvok's response hinted at a spark of suppressed emotion, enough for a fatigued Janeway to register his motives and adjust her nightgown. Because of my court-martial. Duty and logic dictate I stay, at least for a while longer. Tuvok, Admiral Janeway didn't sacrifice herself so you could delay treatment. I agree with Admiral Patterson, Captain. This is inconvenient. Aren't all medical procedures an inconvenience? She said to herself. They force the body into an intense change with lasting consequences. It doesn't matter how advanced medicine is. Janeway knelt in front of Tuvok's chair. Your needs outweigh mine. Captain, my testimony. I should be by your side. Be with your family first. Then you can be here with me. If Tuvok adhered to logic, it entailed him staying, attending the trial until it finished, then return home. To leave Earth today and return later, wasted time. Illogical. Computer, a glass of water, 10 degrees Celsius. Catherine approached the replicator as Tuvok offered a second option. I could request my family to come. She faced him before taking a sip. How are you traveling to Vulcan? Visible discomfort appeared on the Vulcan's face as he calculated more than one finished thought. Her emotional reasoning exceeded his deference to logic as he answered with slow frustration. The USS Challenger will pass near my planet. Then I can arrange transport on a Vulcan vessel. With a moistened mouth, she forced a smile and asked when he would depart. His tone shifted and prepared words left his lips. In an hour? Regardless of Patterson's preference, Voyager, safe inside the Sol system, didn't need its chief of security. Catherine rested her hand on Tuvok's shoulder. He didn't take his eyes off her empty coffee cup, frustrated with knowing she needed his guidance. Last moments aboard Voyager forced them apart when, for the last seven years, it was impossible. The smile for her friend disappeared. So soon? Well, I'm glad we had this time together. Resigned to illogical circumstances, he asked the obvious question. Captain, how do you feel? Catherine reclaimed her seat before responding. Thirty-two. Tuvok processed her hardened answer with logic but understood numbers aren't emotional explanations. Starfleet has brought 32 charges against me. She inhaled an audible breath while staring at nothing in particular, unconsciously looking for a way to escape. Tuvok lifted an eyebrow. It appears Starfleet has been thorough in examining ship's logs from our data streams. I've been punched to the floor. 
Theodoric is like a father to me. He had his orders, but... Her outburst faded, and she didn't know what to do with her hands. Her composure returned when she laced her fingers. When does your trial begin? In a few days. I suppose you want to see the charges. I can't do much else to assist. Curiosity compels me to answer, yes. Catherine collected the pad Patterson had presented her with from the bedside table. Tuvok raised another eyebrow studying the charges as Catherine stared out of the window into space. Operations Officer's Log. Stardate 55028.1. My first log is full lieutenant. I'm sampling some of my new responsibilities one day before shore leave begins. I'm to debrief Admiral Mitchell on our Delta Flyer. As the highest-ranking bridge officer serving aboard Voyager, I find myself representing this entire crew's endeavors. Tom Paris skipped through the shuttle bay doors and the security officers posted outside as Harry introduced the Delta Flyer to Admiral Mitchell. Ensign Vorick sat inside and initiated its startup sequence. Earth-brown skin grew creases as Mitchell turned his neck to witness Tom. Short of breath, the Admiral stood on the Delta Flyer's ramp as he greeted him. Ah, Mr. Paris, good morning. I know you're busy packing. We only need your assistance for a few minutes. Thomas leaned back on the ramp, caught unaware with the flag officer's candor. Thank you, and no problem, sir. He straightened his disheveled civilian attire in front of the unknown Admiral. Harry studied his pad in the split second Tom glanced at him for help. Mitchell's Vulcan aide, similar age to Vorik, noticed Tom's confusion. This is Admiral Carter Mitchell. He heads the Pathfinder project with your father. Tom nodded with raised eyebrows, smiled and shook hands. Your father has of course informed me about your achievements, Mr. Paris, and I think you have a problem. Mr. Paris closed his mouth, raised his chin to brace for the impact of his past, now caught up with him. Oh? Follow me for a moment. Mitchell walked off the ramp and inspected the Delta Flyer's underbelly. Harry Kim and Mitchell's aide followed three steps behind. I praised Lieutenant Kim earlier on this fine-looking craft, and I want you to present the design to our engineering corps. Have the flyer mass produced, or its systems integrated into future shuttle designs. My ship design, presented to Starfleet? For the second time in my life, I don't know what to say. I know how protective you feel of this child, Tom. Harry caressed the bare duranium sheeting to emphasize his joke. Admiral Mitchell stared. Mr. Kim took his hand off the ship, seeing all eyes rested on him to explain. Mr. Paris's wife gave birth yesterday, sir. Harry smiled, showing his teeth. Oh, then more congratulations are in order. It's becoming an eventful couple of days for you. The Admiral slapped Tom hard on his shoulder, as though to certify his status with becoming a father and a son on the same day. Uh, thank you, sir. He peeked in Harry's direction. His friend acted unperturbed by the Admiral's conversational manner. Anyway... I want a presentation made for a later star date. Mitchell gestured with the hand that hit him. Please, introduce me to the flyer's helm. Cargo bay doors whined, and Admiral Patterson appeared inside the flyer accompanied by a technician. Harry stiffened upright against the shorter but imposing flag officer. Attentive to his friend's posture, Tom assured Harry with a nod, having dealt with Patterson's prickly attitude before, and knew what to expect. Tommy, it's welcome to see you again. Admiral Patterson brightened up people's first names, his way of branding those closest to him. Addressed as Tommy, again brought flashes of memories from his childhood. Uh, yes, sir. Theodoric scanned the younger man's clothing. I see the captain kept you away from trouble. Oh, I wouldn't say it was too difficult. My options for running away being limited this time. Both men shook hands, belying their personal history. You certainly make good use of your parole, then. Oh, definitely, sir. Good. Keep it that way. Patterson whisked around Tom and positioned himself next to Admiral Mitchell. Now, maybe you can assist us with this little number, Tommy. Care to explain the flyer's capabilities? Even if Mr. Carter is trying to claim this craft for himself. You'll get your turn, Theo? Of course, I could send you the specs instead. No, no, I'm here now. Let's continue. For Harry, the professional rivalry became valuable insight having never seen flag officers this cordial. Only Pathfinder's department had access to Voyager and items she carried. Patterson's eyes widened at his opportunity. Mitchell absorbed the ship's aesthetics and design motifs and gave Tom another hard, assuring pat on his shoulder as he helped himself to the helm. 
You're piloting, sir? Mr. Paris, much like yourself, I relish the chance to fly. In the flyer's case, I want to feel her. I've been eager to know more about this craft since the first data streams. Admiral Mitchell's hands celebrated the tactile controls. He twisted and pushed knobs, judging the flyer's responsiveness, giddy with putting into practice the schematics he had memorized. You would have loved our first flyer. It had more throwbacks than this one. Mitchell opened his mouth to respond, but Admiral Patterson interjected. Yes, that's all well and good, gentlemen. Carter, bond with Tommy later. Authoritative words rang in their ears, jolting the flyer's newest pilot. The old, bearded man hung over them larger than both thought possible, his arms folded behind his midriff, waiting for the Delta flyer to disembark. I want to see what this craft can do. Computer, turn off sickbay lights. Deactivate the emergency medical... Sickbay doors interrupted him. A person stood at the entrance, with the EMH trying to verify the silhouetted face. Hello? Doctor, what are you doing in the dark? Just getting used to my future aboard Voyager. Computer, activate lights in sickbay. Reginald Barkley tilted his head, confused at the reply. That's a bit melodramatic. I was closing shop, as they say. My official duties are done. He explained Belana finished her postnatal care and had checked Tuvok one last time, sending his medical history to Vulcan. With nothing else to do aside from working on his hollow novel or waiting for Starfleet Medical to contact him, he desired to shut down for a while. I see. Barclay smiled and his finger jabbed the air between them. How about a new beginning? Something more engaging? Think of it as a sabbatical. The doctor kept turning his neck, tracking Reginald's pacing around. Starfleet Medical may not have spoken to you, but my friends at Pathfinder certainly want to. He grabbed his shoulders, anchoring the man. Reg, you've become my liberator. When do we leave? Well, Admiral Patterson already approved Pathfinder's requisition request, so it's when you're willing and able, my friend. The EMH snatched his hollow emitter, stormed towards sickbay doors, and commanded the ship's computer to turn the lights off for a final time. Mr. Barclay gestured. You lead the way, Doctor. From the Delta Flyer's vantage, Voyager looked as humdrum as the rest of Earth's space traffic. Admiral Mitchell piloted at one-quarter impulse towards the massive structure. To Lieutenant Tom Paris, the Federation Starbase's shape evoked the mental image of a 21st century spark plug. Tom's and Harry's eyes widened at the grandeur of Starbase One as they cruised forward. Mr. Paris welcomed the sight. Thinking about the structure's technical specifications diverted his attention until he remembered the Admiral's remark about only needing him briefly. What's the plan, Admiral? Mitchell, delighted, studied his flight plan. Just a quick trip around the block, Mr. Paris. Nothing to worry about. His hands tightened around the controls. I have to say, this craft's responsiveness is superior to other auxiliary craft, even a peregrine's. The handling is as smooth as bully and butter. Of course a peregrine, sir. That design is ten years old. Hold on, Mr. Paris. We've updated those designs. They're not limited to academy training exercises anymore. Ha! Huh. Ask the Gem Hadar or the Cardassians. The Delta Flyer's newest pilot pacified Tom without taking his eyes off the view. Earth's starbase grew in stature as they approached. Admiral Mitchell intended to circle the brilliant white celestial object. He operated the customized helm controls, however, with the grace of an academy cadet. Brace yourselves, warned Mitchell. As their craft made the turn, the flyer shuddered. Proximity alert. And its occupants gripped the handrails so as to avoid being bumped from their seats. I forgot to compensate for the local gravity of the station, he announced, still smiling. Tom shrugged off his comment. Sir... What is bullion butter like? You joke, Mr. Paris. I used to be quite a pilot, not even that long ago. Harry checked helm control. He glanced at his friend, confirming they had flown too close to the station. Admiral, when did you last sit at helm control? In the Dominion War, Lieutenant. Mitchell's eyes glanced at screen readouts. The Dominion War sounded like ancient history with his reply underplaying past achievements. He expressed vigor at the controls taking advantage of his admiral's privileges. Harry pushed out his lower lip, unable to say anything, being both too young and far away to have experienced the war. 
The man who spent time in a New Zealand penal colony didn't speak either. He didn't want to facilitate a conversation about Cardassian politics. That topic founded the antagonism with his father. As Mitchell pointed the Delta Flyer at Voyager, he relaxed, entering a state of nirvana. Admiral Patterson sat considering at the rear of the cockpit with both aides and Vorik. The grey, bearded Admiral tapped his knuckles on an inactive console. He had seen enough. The Vulcan turned his head, witnessing Patterson arriving at a conclusion, and watched the Admiral activate his comm badge. Admiral Patterson to the USS Sovereign. Commander Harkness, please initiate the launch as discussed. Harry's and Tom's faces turned to the stone-faced man. Gentlemen, I assume you've installed standard wargame protocols for this craft. Captain Proton couldn't protest before Vorik answered for both of them, solidifying Patterson's intentions. Admiral, I believe we did install such protocols. The slap on his shoulder startled Tom. Mr. Paris, it's your turn, if you please. Mitchell smirked, understanding what Theodoric wanted, and had relinquished the pilot's seat. Tommy, Captain Janeway has informed me on many occasions you're Voyager's best pilot. Yes, sir. Stood upright, hands behind his back, his dad's friend directed a head nod towards the window. Tom glanced at his screens and calculated they had under two minutes. Harry, take tactical. In his swift thinking, he forgot Harry was the senior officer. I'm on it. Harry handed his pad to Mitchell's aide. Mitchell lowered his voice while touching shoulders with Patterson. You didn't inform me of this. If we're constructing these flyers, I want to be sure. Sensors showed two small craft approaching from their aft. A peregrine and a runabout, with the former being the faster, gaining on them. Tom changed course and noted the peregrine braking formation. This pilot's keen. His screen calculated an opportunity of ten seconds to engage before the other vessel arrived. He performed an about to turn and readied his first pass like a jousting knight. The flyer's weapons range reached further than the peregrine's. Harry fired with the side phaser array as Tom swerved. They scored against its underside before the other craft responded. Simulator software recorded the hit, but the tactical readout recorded minimal damage. Their opponent fired its aft phasers, nudging their expectations of an easy score. I believe Mr. Carter informed you we made some upgrades. The quip from Patterson, like a second blast of phaser fire, jolted their understanding of their predicament. You've been in the Delta Quadrant for too long. The simulated damage tasked them more than Tom expected. She can certainly pack a wallop. The runabout entered firing range as Harry Touch tapped through some operations. Let's keep some space between us and the Peregrine. We can pick it off at a distance. Easier said than done with that Yellowstone out there. But I do have an idea. Tom switched from looking at his screen to the flyer's window. Ready, two photonic missiles for remote detonation. As the flyer avoided phaser fire from the fighter, the runabout closed in. Two shots hit their rear. The computer announced the warp drive had gone offline. Shields held at 80%. We don't need warp drive. Launch missile one now! The opposing vessels scanned the launch as intended and scattered in opposite directions. Tom followed through, catching the Peregrine's pilot off balance as they attempted a maneuver to salvage the situation, like a gazelle kicking out on hind legs in a futile attempt to push the Predator away. Against the Delta Flyer's Borg-inspired pulse phases, it couldn't withstand the barrage. Tom didn't need the computer's confirmation. The Peregrine was adrift. He looked at the status of his shields. They held steady at 50%. Get us within 20 meters of the Peregrine. I have an idea for our other missile. As the runabout re-entered weapons range, the Flyer dropped its second payload on the disabled craft. The Flyer, motionless above the fighter, hid its berth. Arriving with heavy fire, the runabout crew remained unconvinced by the act of playing dead. Tom noted the damage, but he didn't move, letting the second missile stay hidden. At the last moment, Tom activated the enhanced impulse thrusters. The simulated blast wave scored tremendous damage on the runabout. Knocking out its sensors and impulse drive, the runabout drifted and was at the flyer's mercy. Tom and Harry turned to both admirals. Patterson breathed through his nose and snorted as he tapped his comm badge. Commander Harkness, come and collect your craft. Mitchell crossed his arms, excited at the outcome. Theodoric stared at Mr. Paris, impressed with Admiral Paris's son rather than the flyer. Well done, Mr. Kim. Well done, Tommy. Regeneration cycle complete. Seven and Echeb completed their regeneration cycles, 
causing the Borg Nooks to power off. Both newcomers to the Alpha Quadrant had scarcely anything to pack. They stepped off the platform. I will contact the Pathfinder crew, informing them of our status. They will beam up immediately. She tapped on a console and messaged Pathfinder. This is your last day aboard Voyager. Use your time appropriately. Determined eyes processed her statement. Either you run the day, or the day runs you. Jim Rohn. Who is Jim Rohn? A motivational speaker from Earth's 20th century. Do you require motivation? I am contemplating my destiny. When you rescued me from the Borg Sphere, you told me I'd find mine. Here I am half a galaxy away. Your destiny will have further to go, no doubt. The Academy offers much. You will do well joining Starfleet. What about you? Seven blinked slowly. I will also do well. She stared at the console. Pathfinder acknowledged her message. Since we can't take the alcoves. My first task is to proceed with miniaturizing the portable regenerator and construct two. Afterwards, I will visit my aunt. He turned and looked at her work table. I estimate a 70% reduction, given current constraints. 75%, and will include the UPS function. Ejeb smiled. And your day? I'm supposed to meet Tuvok. He said to see him before he leaves. But I also want to visit Captain Janeway. You are contemplating her destiny. As Ejeb processed her question, she answered instead. As have I, but character is destiny, Heraclitus. Ejeb thought again. Computer, locate Commander Tuvok. Commander Tuvok is on deck three, Captain's quarters. They must be saying goodbye. Then so shall we. I will modify my schedule. A team of engineers with Professor O'Brien poured through the cargo bay doors. Good morning. Our personnel are ready to assist. Professor O'Brien, when I return I require your assistance, and this item is to be left untouched. She pointed to her table, holding the portable regenerator. Miles raised an eyebrow, wondering what he would be required for. One family enjoying the ship tour belonged to Ensign Samantha Wildman. The Wildman family reunited on board instead of on Earth. Her parents wondered how their daughter raised their granddaughter on a starship. Samantha's sister brought nieces she hadn't met before. Naomi Wildman behaved as though her three cousins visited to only amuse her. Wherever the children played, the ship received warmth from their activities. If the children discovered a section of a ship off-limits, they screamed and declared the floor awash with lava. As Naomi led their tribe to the mess hall, the children raced the disinterested adults, wise to their spontaneous challenges. They claimed they won by arriving first at the buffet queue, not the mess hall seats, before their seniors. Living planet-bound for much of their lives, Samantha could count on one hand the occasions her parents journeyed beyond Earth's atmosphere. This visit allowed her to include her ring finger. Samantha, the only sibling not native to the Sol system, had matured into the most adventurous family member. In a corner of the mess hall with no lava, three former members of the crew sat alone in conversation. You're already eight, Mariah Henley told Garen. I passed by her quarters. She's also packed. She always wants to be prepared. Garen dismissed Henley's shock. Kenneth Dalby, unconcerned, stared into Chell's galley. I have a question. Belana's baby. Was she born in the Delta Quadrant or the Alpha Quadrant? I have a better question. Dalby interrupted, ignoring Henley's contemplative face freeze. What does Chell save for us today? Dalby's breakfast mates looked towards the Bolian. Come on, Chell, what do you have for me? Chell's form, blocked by the galley partitions, made enough noise for his audience to track his movements. The waiting trio followed the kitchen sounds with trained eyes. Chell swept around from behind his service counter. Chell's mouth beamed bright blue pink. I have some. I have some for my friends. Some of the tastiest. Chell stopped squawking in his rushed, excited tone as he presented the food. His face beamed with delight at the effort expressed. Ooh, this looks lovely. Dalby's face switched to disappointment. Wait a minute. Where is that aged stew? Oh, that was too aged. Chell tutted. You're saving it for yourself. Next you'll tell me it's only for Bolian stomachs. So him and Ensign Galwat then? Henley added a knowing wink. The head of the table responded with bluntness. Chell probably asked to be ship's cook, just to get closer to Galwat. Chell revealed nothing. He waited for the obvious question about the meal from Dalby. So what is this? Earth classic. Bubble and squeak. He said, satisfied then performed an about turn and greeted the Wildman children. 
He caught them about to make a small mess at his buffet counter. Never mind. Dalby stated with his fork now in hand. Anyway, Kenneth, are you happy to be back? Am I happy, huh? He scoffed as he attacked his meal with more scrutiny to the food than the conversation. Why is that? Come on, what exactly is there for us? Chell's cooking? Our reputation? Heck, I thought we'd stay stranded. Henley waved away his statement. That's your nihilism talking. No, I even agreed with Lieutenant Paris when he admitted Voyager was his home. So what have I returned to? Turns out there isn't much for our captain either. Surely there's something. Dalby casually pointed at Henley with his knife. It's been a while since I fought a Cardassian. He sneered and resumed eating. Her face grimaced without him noticing. Geron edged into the conversation and she turned, facing him. I can wear this again. Geron highlighted his Bajoran earring. It had gone unnoticed. She smiled, happy he could brush aside Starfleet's dress code. I'm ready to go straight home. There you go, I'm doing exactly that. Dalby celebrated, stabbing upwards with his knife. Go home? But it's gone. Henley said, confused. Not my home. Jaren's home. Bajor! And why the hell not? Let's get you a nice Bajoran lady. Geron rocked backwards from the solid slap to his shoulder. He bared his teeth, but didn't express full confidence in Dalby's idea. I'm sure Tabor feels the same way. Let's ask. He tapped his communicator. Dalby to Tabor. Tabor here. Tabor, are you visiting anywhere before heading to Bajor? No, why? No reason. Dalby out? Mariah sighed, deflated with Dalby's uninspiring behavior. He had hit a reset upon returning, and his time aboard Voyager amounted to naught. Masked by her coffee mug, she wondered if he might be right. Starfleet expelled them. Her experience should be invaluable, but her career options evaporated last night, even with seven years of service. Samantha settled her children. She asked her sister for a minute and walked over to the isolated threesome. Good morning. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to say I don't agree with Starfleet's decision. I enjoyed serving with you and wouldn't mind continuing, given the chance. Henley placed her warm brew on the table. Thank you. Dalby wrestled with a smile, not expecting such fondness. Geron worked with Samantha often in the science department, and sometimes babysat Naomi. His smile squashed a mouthful against the side of his cheeks, inflating them. I also couldn't help overhearing, you're going to Bajor? So are we. You can book transport with us if you'd like. We'll let you know. Henley smiled, unsure of what else to say. Geron grinned and gestured a thumbs up, ignoring Dalby's reluctant nodding. Lovely. We'll see you on the transport ship. Well, enjoy Chell's last breakfast. Samantha returned to the Wildman's section of the mess hall. Henley turned to Dalby, resupplied with ammunition to fire at him. We've still got friends. Yes. Okay, Henley. He rolled his eyes, deflecting her optimism. Mariah, what do you think Chakotay is going to do? Good question. Why didn't you ask when he called us all together last night? Huh. Let's ask him now. Dalby switched on his communicator, but did so with the back of his hand so it wouldn't initiate. The tease activated Geron out of his usual quiet posture. No, let's speak to him later. Dalby smirked and wielded his knife again. Geron asked Henley about her plans. She stared at the Wildman family. I will visit my sister. By this point, Chell arranged with Naomi's help three tables to make one long table to accommodate everyone. The Naraka system? Geron asked, causing Mariah to look at him. Naraka 3, to be exact. Dalby sassed across the mess hall. Chell, where are those Argavian burgus we picked up in the Delta Quadrant? Catherine, in civilian clothing, impatient with Tuvok reflecting on Starfleet's charges, packed personal items into a carry-all. Reasoning on the scant amount of distracted sleep, she had no professional nor personal desire to remain on board. When Tuvok returned the pad, the door beeped. Janeway spoke softly while fastening her bag. Come in. Admiral Owen Paris entered without restraint, walking into the center of his junior officer's quarters. As the morning suits you, Catherine. Commander Tuvok, don't get up, please. She glared at him with a heavy chin from across her room. Janeway rushed to him, bag slung over her shoulder. Did you know? Only this morning. I came as soon as I was informed. She stepped away. I see. Her body relaxed, and the carryall fell to her side. Well, that gives me some comfort. Owen put his arms on her shoulders and gave her a second heartfelt hug. 
Tuvok watched the two senior officers, unmoved. Owen pulled away and informed her he also had an official reason for his arrival. He knew it wouldn't help, his face contorted to one side. Catherine, besides coming as your friend, I am informing you of Starfleet's reasoning. They have reasons? She murmured as she placed her hand on the table, as though to support herself. Hmm. Tuvok heard the disappointment in her voice. I paraded this crew, this ship, myself over Starfleet headquarters and the Academy yesterday. And for why? Catherine, Starfleet wants to recognize your unique effort. Bureaucrats no doubt thought this would service everyone. Is that why nobody from Starfleet attended the dinner? Please, to bring your crew home, to... No one can take that away from you. You have performed an extraordinary job, but these are extraordinary circumstances. Janeway glared. Admiral Patterson, Admiral Paris, both men who nurtured her formative years, were now in difficult positions. Owen stepped closer. Rear Admiral Bennett issued the court-martial proceedings on this... She interrupted. I've met Bennett. She understood the shame with being reacquainted across a courtroom with him. Admiral Bennett doesn't let personal affiliations influence his decisions. His manner is almost Vulcan. You have returned when Starfleet is reflecting on post-war issues. There have been legal and operational repercussions. He gestured outside at the USS Sovereign, waiting to escort Voyager to Utopia Planitia. In some respects, Starfleet was complacent prior to the Dominion War. I dare say even before Wolf 359. Building luxurious galaxy and nebula-class starships with civilians on board. Owen stepped forward. While Starfleet's primary purpose is unaltered, frontline ships like that one are more tailored towards combat. They don't include families. The very nature of first contact missions has changed. Our responsibilities have become a lot more... He frowned, wondering if he had overexplained. She leant against the table, but listened. I wonder if your circumstances would be kinder if you arrived later, with these issues settled. The door beeped creating a moment of silence. But before Janeway could vocalize an answer to his statement, or the person waiting outside, he summarized the point he was trying to make. Starfleet wants to minimize risks moving forward. Janeway optioned for the door. Barclays and the doctor's faces tried hiding the awkwardness of seeing the security guards posted. Catherine placed her bag by the entrance. Admiral! <laughs> exclaimed Barclay. I'm... I'm... We're just saying our g goodbye to the captain. Uh, the requisition order, sir? He motioned with his head to the doctor. Both men could see the admiral, tense. Yes, it's fine. Come in, gentlemen. Do these new procedures involve inviting men into my quarters? The admiral forgot he wasn't in his office. She raised her hand, forgiving his mistake. Owen understood he had erred and moved to the window. The rest of our conversation can wait, Catherine. The doctor's programming sensed a need to be expedient. Captain, I've come to tell you I'll be on Earth with Pathfinder. I'm glad you won't be staying as well. Her door beeped a fifth time. This might actually be a conference room. She protested with raised arms. The interruptions took their toll. Space and time was a privilege in the Delta Quadrant, now stolen from her. Every time the doors opened, it pained her to see the guards posted. Seven, Echep, come in. I think we have enough room. Echeb spoke without regard for what preceded their arrival. Captain, we both thought it prudent to visit before I departed. She didn't reply as the room's occupants shuffled across, accommodating two more guests. We wanted to say thank you, and you can count on our support. Seven scanned the room, noticing everyone wore the same expressionless faces as Tuvok. Janeway leaned on the wall panel, as though intuiting this occurrence. She tapped the button. Four more individuals filled the remaining space in her quarters, she thought of the briefing room as Chakotay, Balana, Harry, and Tom filtered in. Captain! Balana struggled to find more comforting words. She shared a hug instead. In the embrace, Balana couldn't see her captain tear up, but sensed as much with the silence surrounding them. Owen looked at the USS Sovereign again. Others waited and watched both women. Balana smiled, hoping her warmth helped. Catherine broke their embrace, and Balana stood by Tom. Janeway scooped up the pad and grabbed her bag. I appreciate all of this, but I don't have answers. We're not asking questions, Catherine. She drew in a deep breath. Admiral, permission to leave the ship. 
The Admiral nodded without looking at her. Doors swished open, and before Janeway exited, she looked to her newly promoted lieutenant. Make sure everyone gets home. The gold pips on his collar shifted as he swallowed in response. Yes, ma'am. Janeway slung her bag over her shoulder. The two security officers followed her as the doors clasped together. Admiral Paris's comm badge broke the silence. Paris to Patterson. Catherine is leaving Voyager. Automatic doors operate with disinterest in the emotional well-being of life forms. People can't slam doors in a fit of rage or close them gently. They operate to how they are programmed. The sterile metallic material is incapable of representing emotional complexities. Starship interiors, forever immaculate, never exude sadness or happiness. Janeway's Lambda One holodeck program could. What pained Catherine existed in Lord Burley's mansion? A home with weary wooden doors, chipped and cracked tired walls, and floorboards creaking from decades of use. These primitive household features mirrored what Catherine imagined unleashing in her anguish. Mr. Ayala and Ensign Vorick conversed in the transporter room. Mr. Ayala's eyes performed a double take as she entered and stepped onto the transporter pad. The security entourage and silence surrounded her. The group posed like a routine away mission. Janeway's tears broke that notion. Quick with wiping water from her eyes, she acknowledged her two comrades. The security officer directed Vorick to transport them to Cascades Park, Bloomington, Indiana. As Vorick operated the controls to initiate transport, Mr. Ayala stood to attention. The Vulcan raised his hand as Captain Catherine Janeway materialized off Voyager's transporter pad. If you enjoyed listening, please tell just one fellow Trekkie, leave a review or a star rating. If you'd like to be a Patreon for early access to episodes, exclusive extras, or to just contact me, check the show notes for more information.